to be joined in one second with Nick Redfern, uh, who is uh, originally from England, now lives in Texas. He's the author of very many books. I won't go too detailed into an introduction because he uh, deserves every minute he can get up here and he's got a flight quickly after. So I'm going to just welcome Nick Redfern uh, to the stage. Um, I'm sure all of you, can everybody hear me? Mic's not on. Oh. I've got a radio mic. Where is it in your pocket? It is on. Try it again. One, two, three. No. It's not on. Is that better? Oh, OK, good. <laughs> OK, we'll start. Um, I'm sure all of you at some point will have heard of the so-called flying triangle mystery or phenomenon that's sort of plagued much of the world uh, for the last 15 years or so. Um, what I'd like to do for you today is basically discuss the flying, uh, flying triangle mystery from the perspective of trying to determine is it representative of some form of advanced technology. Can we look at these reports and say that, yes, something's flying around that appears to possess a technology that's far in advance of our own? Or are we looking at kind of a next generation stealth aircraft developed by the military in stealth, if you like? Um, or is something else going on where it's a combination of the two? And what I'm going to do is, unlike a lot of the lectures I do, where I generally show slides and things like this and images, Today, you've got me as a talking head, because what I've done, um, when John asked me to do the lecture, uh, he said, can you do something on British government files, which perhaps represent evidence of some form of advanced technology being shown in the official reports that the government has declassified? And I said, sure. And I guess synchronistically, as, as often happens in this subject, um, I came across, literally at the last minute, a number of very intriguing flying triangle reports which I was able to track down the original witnesses, a number of which were actually Ministry of Defence employees themselves. And so hopefully that will provide you with a few scoops this afternoon of information. But because it was literally last minute data, um, I don't have visuals to go with them. But nevertheless, the, the testimony is all here, which I'll hope will capture people's attention. Um, I'm talking about government files on flying triangles. So I thought what I would do first would be to kind of give you some background on the process by which government files are declassified in England, um, not just on flying triangles or UFOs, but just generally government files as it relates to official secrecy. And the British government operates something called the 30-year ruling. And as you can probably guess by that term, it means that all government files, regardless of age, regardless of classification, have to, be, have to remain classified for a minimum of 30 years. Now, if you look at these reports, files. Some of them can be uh, considered top secret, secret, classified, restricted, but they all, all have this period of 30 years before they can um, enter into the public domain. And there isn't, as a lot of people assume, just a, a blanket release of material after 30 years. The, the files are reviewed periodically, and if when they reach that 30-year period, a determination is made that, yes, the documents can be released, yes, they can be put in the public domain. Then they're transferred to a place just outside London, formerly called the Public Record Office, but now called the National Archives, kind of like the, the uh, American National Archives in Maryland. Well, as far as UFOs are concerned, the government has now declassified somewhere in the region of about three to 4,000 pages of material covering actually as far back as 1911 and through to about 1972. The exception to this rule is that in, in the last couple of years, kind of a quasi Freedom of Information Act has surfaced, which has allowed some files from more recent years to surface, including the, the so-called Rendlesham Forest file of 1980. And the, the Rendlesham Forest file, a lot of people think that that's the most substantial and prolific file on UFOs at the Public Record Office that the British government's declassified. There actually are several others. One famous case from 63, um, which literally runs to about 200 pages in length and that doesn't really get that much attention, I think possibly because of its age and not really many people know it exists. But nevertheless, in the last few years, we've begun to see this documentation service into the public domain. And I've tried to focus my attention 
on determining what we can find from these files, what they tell us, what they don't tell us, which departments and agencies investigated the reports and their findings and conclusions. And why I got interested in this particular aspect of the UFO mystery is because my father used to work in the British Royal Air Force. He worked on radar. And he was involved in several incidents in the early 1950s when fast-moving objects were tracked on the radar scopes overflying the North Sea from Scandinavia, Norway, Sweden, on a heading for Britain. And even though these things were traveling at heights of 50 to 60,000 feet and speeds far in excess of anything that we, the Americans or the Russians, were flying at the time, the first thought was, is this the Russians launching a sneak attack? And so aircraft were scrambled from a nearby Air Force base. Um, they, the pilots reported seeing these strange lights in the sky. The, the pilots also said that as they, as they approached the objects, the objects would actually slow down and allow the pilots to close in on them and then quickly shoot behind them as if they were playing a game of tag or cat and mouse, if you like. And this went on literally to the point where the air crews had to return to base because they were running low on fuel. And my father related this account to me when I was about 14. And he added how the radar tapes were impounded. Everybody was sworn to secrecy and told not to talk about it. And I guess this kind of sparked off several things in my mind. One being the fact that he was a credible person, my own father, talking about UFOs, um, which was kind of really eye-opening to me, as I hadn't really given the subject much thought up until that point, I guess, like most people, until you're exposed to it. And from there, I guess, there was the fact that the, the way the UFOs were described, the maneuvers they were carrying out, this was, as, as the theme of the conference is this weekend, evidence of some sort of superior technology, an advanced technology that was flying rings around the, the best of the British Royal Air Force that existed at the time. And thirdly, the fact that everybody was sworn to secrecy suggested that whatever the government, I use government as kind of a generic catch-all term for all the agencies involved, that whatever the government knew about this subject, it obviously didn't want the general public or the media knowing due to the fact that everybody was sworn to secrecy. And I always think that if there's something that governments don't want you, you to know about, it's probably actually worth knowing. And so I began to dig into this subject a little bit more as a teenager, just from the perspective of looking, just reading books and magazine articles. And then when I found in the mid-1980s that the public record office were beginning to slowly declassify files, 15 or 20 pages here or there, I began to make a, a deeper study of their contents and the implications presented in the files. And I'll be the first one to admit that of the three to 4,000 pages that have been declassified, the overwhelming majority of the reports kind of fall into the category of the old Project Blue Book files. They're not overly substantial. They're primarily lights in the sky type reports. Say, for example, on the 10th of June, 1963, Mr. Jones of the city of Leeds saw a blue light, and the report reaches the Ministry of Defense maybe a week or two later, and they figure that there isn't a great deal they can do with the report beyond file it. And that is, the, the overwhelming majority of the reports do fall into those types of categories. But amongst the, the more innocuous reports, there are substantial accounts and encounters that do stand out as being a lot more significant and, again, display evidence of some sort of advanced technology. Now, one of the cases that, or one of the little scoops that I just want to discuss with you, which potentially has a link with advanced technology, is the crop circle issue. Just very recently, in the last couple of weeks, the British government declassified a number of files from the Second World War. Um, one of these files deals with sightings by British bomber pilots flying over Europe in the war of what they described as large circles and patterns uh, mowed into the corn in certain fields. And because this was the height of the Second World War, the first thought, or the, the primary thought, was that is this the work of German spies carving coded messages for bomber pilots, telling them where to, which city to bomb? Which I guess, in, you know, in one way, is kind of a, an interesting theory. But... The important factor in all this, I think, is that here is now prime evidence of government investigations of complex, complex crop formations found 60 years ago, which actually reached the highest levels of the British intelligence community, namely MI5, which is the, the British equivalent of the FBI. And so it's things like this where I consider that some of these aspects of the UFO phenomena, such as 
crop circles, which I believe are connected, do demonstrate some form of advanced technology, and they are finding their way into the government's official files and the files of the Royal Air Force and the intelligence communities. Um, from later years, a number of documents have been declassified, which again display evidence of UFOs showing left and right hand turns, performances that would kill you know, any human pilot with the G-forces, etc. And I think one of the most interesting aspects of the, the UFO mystery, where there's evidence again of an advanced technology being present, is in the so-called vehicle interference cases, where people have been driving down remote or country lanes late at night or in the early hours of the morning, and they've seen an object, a UFO, whatever you want to term it, hovering in front of them, and it's either stopped the car engine and turned all the lights out, or it's slowed the car engine down. And there are actually somewhere in the region about 15 or 20 reports that fall into this category at the Public Record Office that were investigated officially by the Ministry of Defense. And there's some evidence from looking at these reports that, again, the MOD recognized that was, there was an advanced technology at work. And the reason I say that is that almost exclusively in all these vehicle interference cases, the MOD sent personnel out to interview the witnesses, which was kind of unusual that, for the most part, the investigators at the MOD never actually left their offices. They would just consult with radar experts or air defense experts, and they would say, yeah, well, we think this person saw a satellite, or possibly it was a flock of birds, and et cetera, et cetera. But in, in the vehicle interference cases, on every occasion, they sent people out, and they actually interviewed them to the point almost of interrogation, and it kind of makes me wonder if they're aware maybe of other intricacies of, the, of this aspect of the, of the UFO mystery. One theory that was put to was possibly some of these vehicle interference cases were kind of a precursor for, <coughs> excuse me, for an abduction type experience. And that was the prime reason really for the investigations that the government was kind of just picking up on the fact that people were having these bizarre experiences in conjunction with UFO sightings and that maybe that led to the, the reason why they began being so in depth with regard to the vehicle interference um, investigations. But as I said, what I want to discuss with you today primarily are the Flying Triangle reports. And again, as I said, for people who aren't fully conversant with the Flying Triangle mystery, um, over the course of about 15 years, publicly at least, um, people have reported uh, from Britain, America, Belgium, Australia, China, Russia, you name it, they've been seen there, these huge flying triangular shaped objects. Um, many one to 200 feet in length, black, white, illuminated below, um, emitting a low humming noise, and sometimes flashing lights that are beamed down to the ground, flying anywhere from 20 to 30, <coughs> excuse me, 20 to 30 miles an hour to several thousand miles an hour. And again, this to me is prime evidence of some form of advanced technology at work. Now, whereas, say for example, with um, abductions or crop circles, you have people who accept that this, that this is going on, that this is a genuine phenomenon. Um, on the other hand, you have the skeptics that just totally debunk it. Flying triangles are a little bit different because most of the people that actually look into the phenomenon come to the conclusion that, yes, something's going on. But, so it isn't the case that there, there are people who outwardly debunk the FT for phenomenon. What it is, it's that the camps are divided between those who accept that they're possibly evidence of some sort of extraterrestrial technology and those who feel that maybe there's some sort of military technology at work. Well, I suspect that the truth may lie in both camps, that we don't actually have to have this polarized um, image or example, if you like, where it has to be one or the other. And I'll explain to you why that is the case. Um, I said I was going to talk about flying triangle reports that the British government had officially documented. And when I began digging into this aspect of the mystery at the public record office, I figured that if I was lucky, with some of the later reports that were now beginning to surface through the Freedom of Information Act, I might find a few reports, say from 88, 89, 91, that correlated with the big wave of sightings, the famous wave in Belgium that occurred in 1990, when high-performance flying triangles were seen over that country on repeated occasions and were chased by the Belgian Air Force to no avail. Well, what surprised me more than anything else was that I did find flying triangle reports at the public record office, and these flying triangles were identical to the ones being seen right now. That's to say, huge, 
um, emitting a low humming noise, illumination from below, even down to having the characteristic rounded corners. On a lot of these flying triangle reports, or almost exclusively, they're not rigid right angles. They literally have a rounded edge to them. And I found a number of interesting reports that fell into this exact category, but they dated from 1965 and 1969, respectively. Now, this kind of opened my eyes to the fact that, wow, you know, the flying triangles that everybody thinks have been seen for the last 10 or 15 years, and that's why it's an advanced military technology, because they're just surfacing, had actually got it wrong to an extent in the sense that the flying triangles have been flying around in stealth, no pun intended, for, for at least 40 years in the dead of night over Britain. The Ministry of Defence was aware of this, had collated files on the subject, had interviewed witnesses, had gone out to some of the site locations, and had done extensive follow-up work. Now, that, to me at least, suggests the age of these reports. If we were flying these things 40 years ago, then I think it's highly unlikely that, that we would still have them on the secret list today. I can quite understand if they were developed 10 years ago, maybe, that perhaps they wouldn't have been rolled off the drawing board and presented to the world's press. But if identical craft were being seen in the 60s, which these records show they were, then, to me, that suggests the secret weapon theory or the secret aircraft theory, while it may be partially correct, it doesn't explain the entire story of what this sort of advanced technology is. So what I'd like to do for you is just kind of read from a few notes of recent interviews I've conducted with people who not only investigated these things for the Ministry of Defence, but actual um, Ministry of Defence employees who've seen these things themselves and who've never spoken on the record up until now. And I think the most significant report I found was from 1965, and I found this while examining um, a recently declassified bunch of files at the PRO. And I came across a one-page report, which was dated the 28th of March, 1965, and that I almost overlooked it, and, but on second glance, it, it's really one of the most important files, I think, or documents that the British government has declassified, because it confirms a sighting that is absolutely uh, identical to today's FT reports. And it was filed by a man named Geoffrey Brown on the night of 28th of March, 1965, and approximately 9.30 p.m. over the town of Richmond in North Yorkshire, he reported seeing, quote, nine or 10 objects in close triangular formation, each about 100 feet long, illumination, orange illumination below with three lights, each triangular in shape with rounded corners, making low humming noise. Now, if anyone is familiar with the FT phenomenon, you will know that that is a classic description of one of today's FTs, and yet this is from 40 years ago next year. So again, this was something that sort of really opened my eyes to the fact that this is some sort of advanced technology that predates anything that we potentially have today. So recognizing the significance of this document, I set about trying to locate the witness. And fortunately, he actually still lived at the same address that he was living at the time. And one of the, the odd things is that when the Ministry of Defense declassify these files, and there's a report from a member of the general public, when they declassify them, they leave the name and address intact. You can read it. So if you're lucky or careful, you can track some of these people down. And I know that they certainly don't all appreciate UFO researchers turning up on the doorstep 30 years later. But I think the Ministry of Defense are now thinking about changing their stance on this and, and blacking out the witness details, which is, which is fair enough, and I can understand personal privacy. But nevertheless, in this case, I, I tracked down the witness and telephoned him and said, um, you know, I found this report at the public record office. Are you the same Jeffrey Brown who reported this triangular-shaped fleet of aircraft, if you like, in the 1960s? And he said, wow. He said, yeah, I am. He said, where did you get the report? I said, well, it's been declassified, and it's on the shelves at the public record office. And he said, oh, OK. And he said, well, I told the Ministry of Defense about it, but I didn't realize that they would keep it after all these years. And so I proceeded to interview him. And I'll just read you a few quotes from what was a, a fairly extensive interview. Yes, I did send in a report all those years ago, but I didn't think they would have kept it all this time. And today, ironically, he's employed as a clerk at the Ministry of Defense, the very people that investigated his encounter, <laughs> which is kind of unusual in itself. And he said he was driving across the North Yorkshire Moors, which is kind of a, 
an eerie, bleak area at the best of times. And you know, on a moonlit night at 10 o'clock, it's, it's even more mysterious. It kind of looks like something straight out of the Hound of the Baskervilles, where, where you have all these old you know, horror films set. But um, he said he had a 1951 Ford car. And as he approached these objects, he said uh, it was a good car, but a bit unpredictable at times. And I didn't want it to break down on the moor because it was icy cold and the nights were still dark. But the engine began to splutter and die. We never kind of really resolved if this was considered a, a vehicle interference case or if it was just the fact that his car wasn't in very good condition. But um, nevertheless, he, he still remembered that factor. And he said, at first, because it was so dark, I wondered if it might be a weather balloon. But then I had a good look at this thing over the hedge as it was coming towards me and realized how big it was and how low down it was. It was about 100 feet from end to end, about 100 feet above the moors and shaped like a huge triangle. Uh, with rounded corners. It kept coming towards me and then stopped about 200 yards from me over the moors. It hovered for a while. Nothing came out of it, but there was a light below it that just pulsated like a light bulb. There could have been quite a few lights on it, but from a distance, the light just looked like a glow. Then without a warning, it just took off at a speed that isn't recognized. And then he said in typical English fashion, good gracious, it must be a UFO. <laughs> As it shot up, not vertically, but at an angle, a group of others that, that were identical and that were in a triangle or V formation joined it. The others were very, very high, a whole fleet of them. They all then headed south, I think, at, at a tremendous speed and disappeared over the horizon. I saw the main one for no more than a couple of minutes, but after they had gone, I was still stood by the moor watching this fleet disappear. I waited in case something else exciting happened, but of course it didn't. Now, the weird thing was, shortly after this encounter, he reported finding what he described as awful red marks on his skin, which were like a stretch mark, but they were like a deep salmon red and kept coming and going. And this was directly after this encounter. But he said the most bizarre angle was still to come. For about 18 months after the sighting, I would get strange telephone calls from people. These would be every two or three months. They just phoned out of the blue, but didn't introduce themselves. They just said they were from some bureau or other. They didn't mention the name of the bureau, but kept mentioning sightings and asked whether I had seen anything else strange. Had any men come to interview me? Well, he told me that nobody ever did come to interview him. He got no answer as to who these people were. And he stressed to me several times that not only did he not tell his friends or family, it, the, the report went no further, as far as he was concerned at least, than the Ministry of Defense. And certainly back in the 1960s, the MOD wasn't giving out UFO reports to members of the public, and there was no 30-year ruling that was allowing UFO reports to enter into the public domain from the Ministry of Defense. So this was kind of a, a bizarre aspect of the story. And when we discussed this, we kind of mused upon was he contacted and was he kind of, if you like, kept under surveillance and questioned due to the fact that this was some sort of secret aircraft that he'd stumbled upon, or was it because he'd really stumbled on a genuine UFO and the Ministry of Defense recognized this? And again, I think because the technology present was so advanced, these things flying extremely slow speeds and then literally shooting away at potentially hundreds and thousands of miles an hour into the sky and then disappearing into the atmosphere, you know, again, I come back to the argument, if we were flying these things 40 years ago, I think we would be seeing them in use now. If we were just flying them 10 years ago, maybe not. But the files now kind of dismiss that angle, and we're, we're tracing flying triangle reports back further and further in time. So that was 1965. I found other reports from 75, from 77, 79, all similar all having the, the characteristic rounded corners, the low hum, which a number of people actually said was kind of an unpleasant hum that sort of rattled the, the stomachs almost and the, and the heartbeat. Um, the most spectacular wave, as far as I'm concerned, which was investigated by the Ministry of Defense and the Royal Air Force, and which again demonstrated, I think, some sort of advanced technology, occurred in 1993. And one of the people I interviewed who was at the forefront of this investigation was a man named Nick Pope, um, who somebody may know. Nick works for the Ministry of Defense and has done for about 20 years now. And for three years, between 1991 and 1994, he worked in one particular branch of the Ministry of Defense that investigated UFO reports. And it was called the Secretariat of the Air Staff and the division was 2A. So it was called SEC-AS-2A as an abbreviation. And 
For the most part, the work that Nick undertook was, as I mentioned earlier, broadly similar to the work undertaken um, by Project Blue Book. Relatively low level work, um, no personal visits to uh, witnesses, um, just a, a very small budget to investigate these things, no traveling around the country in X-Files style and you know, running around underground bases or running around crop circles, that sort of thing. It literally was a case that people would send reports to Nick's office and he would look at them and he would consult with air defense experts and radar experts and satellite experts to see if there was any correlation. But one of the things I mentioned in my previous books, Covert Agenda and Cosmic Crashes, and just as a quick aside, Bob Brown asked me to mention that he's got copies of Cosmic Crashes for sale because it's now out of print and um, has never had an American printing. So if you're interested in getting that book, you can get it from Bob. But um, the, um, excuse me, the Flying Triangle reports that Nick Pope investigated were probably, as far as I'm aware at least, the most significant cases that came by his office. Um, for the most part, he did receive fairly innocuous reports of lights in the sky. And I'll just explain to you what happened. Um, and this is based directly on a personal interview I conducted with Nick. I arrived at the office at about 8.30 a.m. or 9 a.m. on the morning of March 31, 1993, and my telephone was ringing. I picked it up, and there was a police officer on the other end making a UFO report. He was based in Devon, which is a county in the southwest of England, and told me an account of an incident that had taken place in the early hours of that particular day when he and a colleague who had been on night patrol saw a triangular-shaped UFO at fairly high altitude. He said that the motion was fairly steady and that there were lights at the edges with a fainter light in the middle. And again, that's a typical um, facet of the flying triangle mystery, the, the three lights, one in each corner, and then the center light. To me, said Nick, this was already a description that was becoming quite familiar, both from one or two reports I'd received at the MOD over the years and from my own study and research into the UFO literature. In other words, I was aware that this was a commonly reported shape for a UFO. And he continued, I was also quite pleased, pleased to get a report from a police officer. I won't say that it was rare, but it was slightly unusual to have reports from trained observers like police and military. I would say that of the reports I received in my time at the UFO desk, less than 5% came from, collectively, pilots, military officers, and the police. I had spoken socially to numerous Royal Air Force pilots who had personal sightings, but had never reported them to me officially for fear of ridicule. But that police report was very much the first of many that came to me in that day and over the next week or so. And when taken together, the sightings described took place in a range of times. The earliest was 11 to 11.30 on the evening of the 30th, and the latest was about 1.45 a.m. in the early hours of the 31st. And Nick Pope said to me, the, the police officer said to him, I've been on night patrol for years, but I've never seen anything like this in my entire life. And Nick adds, well, reports came through thick and fast over the course of the next week, so more and more reports came in from police stations, the public, and local RAF stations. In fact, I would say that the total number of reports easily exceeded 100. And that's not 100 UFO reports. That's 100 that fell into this flying triangle category. And it's quite clear from what Nick had to say to me when I interviewed him that one of the most prominent and significant significant incidents in this wave occurred um, at a town called Rugeley, which is in central England, near a large forest called uh, Cannock Chase. And the Cannock Chase is not too far from where I used to live back in England. And it's been the site of numerous UFO encounters over the years. But Nick related the facts to me um, because this one fell squarely into the flying triangle category. This report, he said, was brought to my attention by the community relations officer at RAF Cosford, which is a military base not too far away. The report had come direct from a family and sounded particularly, interest, particularly interesting because, unlike some of the other sightings, this was one of a flying triangle flying at very low level. There had been a family gathering and several members of the family were out on the driveway just saying goodbye to the relatives who were about to drive off. Suddenly, this large triangular-shaped craft flew over them very, very slowly. This was a flat triangle with a light in each corner and a larger light in the direct center. And I said, in fact, not unlike the report filed by the police. And he said, exactly. But there was something else that I'd come across in my investigations that was also present in the Rugeley case, Nick said. This was a low-frequency humming sound coming from the UFO, a humming that they actually described as being quite unpleasant. Imagine standing in front of the speakers at a pop concert, he said, and almost feeling the sound as well as hearing it. That was the effect that they had reported. 
Well, they were so excited and overwhelmed that two of them leapt into the car to give chase. As they did so, they came to a point where they thought, at least, the UFO was so low that it must have come down in a nearby field. They parked the car, jumped out, and looked around, but there was absolutely nothing there. The UFO had gone. Well, if that had been a one-off report, it would have been interesting in itself, but really the, the activities of that night had, had barely begun, as Nick explained to me. The two most significant reports, he said, from, from later that evening began at RAF Cosford shortly after the encounter at Rugeley. This was definitely the highlight and was one of the best sighting reports I received in my entire posting at the UFO desk. The report itself, he explained, came from a guard patrol at Cosford. They were on duty manning entrance points, checking the perimeter fence and such like. All the members of the patrol saw a UFO and again, the description was pretty much the same as most of the others. In this case though, the UFO was at a medium to high altitude. And he makes an important observation. Remember that these witnesses were people who seen a normal course of business, all sorts of aircraft activity, meteorites, fireballs, and so on, and they considered it absolutely out of the ordinary. They submitted an actual two to three page report, which went up the chain of command, and then the report was forwarded on to me, to Nick Pope. In that report, they stated that the UFO passed directly over the base and that this was a particular concern to them. They made immediate checks with various air traffic control radar centers, but nothing ever appeared on the screens, which kind of suggests maybe the employment of some sort of stealth type technology. This was around 1 a.m. Um, whatever the ob object was, whatever its um, location originated from, nobody really knew, but one thing that concerned the guard personnel at Cosford was that the object, as it flew over their base, kind of changed direction slightly and headed for a further base, RF Shawbury, which is about 12 to 15 miles away, as he explained to me. They noticed that this flying triangle was heading on a di direct line for Shawbury. Now, the main concern of the Cosford patrol was to alert RAF Shawbury that the triangle was coming their way, but they also wanted confirmation that they weren't having a mass hallucination. They took a de decision to call RAF Shawbury and this was answered by the meteorological officer. You have to realize, said Nick, that at the time there were literally just a skeleton staff, staff operating purely down to the, the early hours of the morning. So the meteorological officer was essentially on his own. He took a decision to go outside, look in the direction of RAF Cosford and see what he could see. Sure enough, he could see this light coming towards him and he got closer and closer and lower and lower. Next thing, he was looking at this massive triangular shaped craft flying at what, at what was a height of no more than 200 feet just to the side of the base and only about 200 feet from the perimeter fence. Bearing in mind that the meteorological officer could be considered a, a, a very reliable witness, I asked Nick what did he describe. And he said, military officers are very good at gauging sizes and descriptions of aircraft and they're very precise. His quote to me was that the UFO size, the triangle size, was midway between that of a C-130 Hercules and a Boeing 747 jumbo jet. He had eight years' worth of experience with the Royal Air Force, and a Met officer is generally much better qualified than most for looking at things in the night sky. And there are other factors too. Like the family in Rugeley, he heard this most unpleasant low-frequency hum. But unlike their experience, he saw the craft fire a beam of light down to the ground. He felt that it was something like a laser beam or a searchlight. The light was, was tracking very rapidly back and forth and sweeping one of the fields adjacent to the base. He also said, and he admitted this was speculation, that it was as if the UFO was looking for something. Now the speed of the UFO was extremely slow, no more than 20 or 30 miles per hour, which in itself is quite extraordinary, he said. As far as the description is concerned, he said it was fairly featureless, a sort of flat, triangular shaped craft. But if all the descriptions had been identical, I would have been surprised. Well. Just consider that report. This is a report from a serving member of the British Royal Air Force talking about how an aircraft the size of a jumbo jet flew 200 feet above a military base in England, 200 feet from the perimeter fence, beamed down a, light of, a beam of light to the ground as if it was searching for something, and the MOD to this day considers this to be of no defense significance. Um, you know, God forbid if it contained Saddam Hussein or <laughs> Osama bin Laden or somebody like that. You know, I mean, to be flippant, but that is basically what it comes down to. And Nick himself said that they didn't pick this thing up on radar, and he said if it had been hostile, the first anybody would have known would have been if and when the Bombay doors had opened. But, you know, to have a report like that where an object... Um, well, actually, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself right now. 
Um, I'll just go back to Nick. He said that the beam of light retracted into the craft, which then seemed to gain a little bit of height. But then in an absolute instant, the UFO moved from a speed of about 20 or 30 miles per hour to a speed of several hundred of miles per hour, if not thousands. He just suddenly moved off to the horizon and then out of sight in no more than a second or so. And there was no sonic boom. Well, of course, when I received this report and the one from Cosford, I launched as full an investigation as I possibly could. So again, when we're talking about is there evidence that some UFOs exhibited uh, advanced technology, I think this particular case is a prime example where you have something that has the capability of flying at 20 to 30 miles an hour, if not even walking distance, and then from an absolute instant to speed up to several hundred or if not several thousand miles an hour, as the, the Met officer at Cosford said, occurred in this particular case. And Nick Pope added that even though it was fairly obvious to me that there were a number of things that this object was not, I still made the checks anyway to try and eliminate every possibility. And he added kind of uh, ominously, I had a feeling that this one was going to go right at the chain of command, and it certainly did. Um, checks were made with Air Defence Command, with uh, the ballistic missile early warning system in North Yorkshire that tracks or potentially would track incoming nuclear missiles if ever there was a strike on Britain. Um, some of the um, extensive radar tracking systems that can track to near Earth orbit, nothing was found at all. The only thing that was possibly related to maybe one or two sightings was the re-entry of a Russian Cosmos satellite. But even this didn't correlate time-wise, and certainly there's no way that a piece of Russian satellite debris could travel at 30 miles an hour over a military base at a height of 200 feet and you know just hover off into the distance, if you like. So Nick kind of tried to take this to the next, ne next level and said, my next step was to get a map and plot out the various locations where the triangles had been seen. Well, that didn't work out. I was confronted with a map of haphazard, haphazard sightings of the same objects, but all over around the country. There was a concentration of sightings in Devon, Cornwall, Wales, and the Midlands, but there were also sightings from Southampton and Yorkshire. And then he kind of hit on something which I actually hadn't given much thought to before, and it's kind of a strange angle, and it's something that some of the people who are supportive of the idea that at least some triangles are human built, if you like, that it's secret technology, have also picked up on. And Nick said, one interesting point, which is what I'm going to mention, was we were dealing with activity on exactly the same night, but three years later, to the very famous wave of sightings of very similar craft seen over Belgium in 1990. And my favorite theory about this, or at least an idea I floated about, he said, was that this was a deliberate move on the part of whoever was operating the craft. And I asked him what he meant by that, and he said, well, the 1990 encounters occurred on March the 30th and 31st. So did the British ones. And he said, for example, if the media had got a hold of this, it would have been too late to get it in the newspapers on March the 31st. So the earliest date the story could have run would have been April the 1st, or April Fool's Day. And which is kind of, you know, it's kind of a, a light-hearted angle, but if you consider that maybe some of these flying triangles could be um, human-created technology, secret aircraft, and they need to be test-flown, what better time to keep flying them than two days before April Fool's Day when, if it, the story did reach the newspapers, that would be the first opportunity for it to hit the headlines. Everybody's just going to say, oh, yeah, a UFO story on April Fool's Day, you know, what next? And what is kind of strange is that there are actually another wave of sightings of flying triangles over Britain on March the 30th in 97 and 99. In these cases, the triangles were a lot smaller. But again, it's kind of a, an unusual little angle to the subject that hasn't really been picked up on. And you know, I just sort of throw that out there because it, it does correlate uh, date-wise and time-wise. Well, Nick recognized that these rumors are out there um, alleging that there were some sort of um, military contractors, if you like, building advanced technology, advanced flying triangles that were still on the secret list. And he said, we decided we couldn't ignore the various rumors that were doing the rounds about a supposed top secret aircraft developed by the US government and called Aurora, or indeed any hypersonic and or prototype aircraft operated by the Americans. We knew there had been persistent rumors in the aviation world and among the UFO lobby that the SR-71 Blackbird had been replaced by a hypersonic aircraft codenamed Aurora, and that this is what the flying triangles really were. 
I was well aware, added Nick, that there had been some interesting stories about visual and radar sightings around certain air bases. However, I hadn't put much store in these rumors, not least because there had been some very definitive denials from the Americans. He said, but with the March 1993 sightings, and in spite of the denials, we did contact the Americans to make inquiries. These inquiries are made by SEC AS 1A and 1B, which were kind of sister organizations to Nick's department. This was because they have the responsibility relating to the US presence in Britain. Those inquiries bore absolutely no fruit at all. The Americans said, no, we have no aurora, and we can shed no light at all on these flying triangle sightings that have led to your inquiry. But he kind of added an interesting little sideline to that. If anything, he told me, there was an interesting little hint that the Americans, too, were seeing these flying triangles over their territory. As we were making our inquiries, they turned the question around and wanted to know if our Royal Air Force had a triangular-shaped hypersonic prototype aircraft of some sort, too. So presumably, he said, the Americans were having flying triangle sightings also. But this was interesting in light of the fact, he said, that the Americans supposedly got out of UFO investigations back in 1969 when the Air Force's Project Blue Book closed down. Of course, you may not be officially in the UFO game, he added, but you are certainly going to be aware of and take an interest in reports of structured craft in your airspace. So essentially, we drew blanks with the Americans. And again, questions were actually asked in the British Houses of Parliament in 1995 by a, an MP named Lou Smith, and the, the then Minister for Defence, Nicholas Soames, again responded definitively that no, there were no aircraft fitting the description of a large flying triangle flying in British airspace, no permission being given by uh, or given to any overseas countries to covertly fly aircraft fitting this description in the early hours of the morning or late at night. But um, Nick has been quite vocal on the issue of whether or not some of the triangles could be uh, an example of an advanced technology that we built, and he, he feels that isn't the case, and he explained this to me. Bearing in mind that the Americans had inquired at an official level, no less, if the British Royal Air Force had it in its employ something broadly fitting the description of a flying triangle, and we had said no, I still felt obliged to address the issue of whether or not the rumors about secret aircraft being flown by us were true. First, from my own knowledge, of prototype aircraft, unmanned aerial vehicles, and so on, he said, the triangles don't fit into the typical pattern. Where we do have such pieces of kit, they're not tested over the heads of Joe Public. They're tested in a small number of clearly defined ranges and danger areas. You simply do not, he added, fly a prototype craft over a military base or the, over the center of the town of Rugeley or wherever and run the risk that some will, someone will either A, scramble a Tornado F3 aircraft to try and intercept it, or B, take a photograph of it which is going to end up on the front page of the Sun newspaper or Jane's Defense Weekly. It's simply not the way things have done, were done or are done. And he went on to tell me how he made extensive checks throughout the military just to determine if anyone was flying anything that conceivably, even remotely, could fit the description of what was seen and just came up completely blank. Um, one thing he did do was to try and get correlation uh, from the Belgian government of what they found out about their encounters. And he said to me, I approached the Belgians to get a comparison after their sightings. I phoned the air attache at the British Embassy in Brussels, and he spoke to one of the F-16 pilots who had been scrambled to intercept a flying triangle over Belgium back in 1990. Well, the air attache reported back to me that the corporate view of the Belgian defense staff was that they did believe they were dealing with a solid, structured craft. Apparently, the word from the Belgians was, thank God it was friendly. If it hadn't been, it was made clear to me that there was very little that the Belgian Air Force could have done anyway. Well, from there, the, the report went up the chain of command to Nick's superiors, and they're actually very interested in it, purely because there was correlation of this thing being seen traveling across the country. There was correlation from military personnel. And several of his colleagues tried to track the, the movements of the thing with maps and so on. And they actually thought for a while that they got a number of intriguing um, map lines, if you like, where this thing had been flying from the bottom of the country further up the country. Um, he told me that he was very uncomfortable with the idea that this thing or these objects had penetrated our airspace. They weren't picked up on radar, and they were flying around military bases at low level and at low speed in the early hours of the morning when there was less chance of them being seen. He said it made him feel quite uncomfortable from the fact that if these were extraterrestrial, then they certainly were holding their cards close to them, if you like, and, and weren't presenting themselves in the open. But he said to me, 
Personally, I felt that saying object unexplained, unexplained, case closed was not satisfactory. He said, I had every sympathy with the assistant chief of the air staff who said that there was very little we could do. There was no actual hostile intent shown and the objects left the air as mysteriously as they had arrived. But he said, what else could we have done? Really, it was an impossible situation. I can tell you, however, that after this, there are a lot more believers in the extraterrestrial hypothesis among the RAF and the MOD than there had been previously. And I asked him, was, it, was this one of the cases that really changed your mind from being an open-minded skeptic to being a believer in the idea that there really is something out there? And he said, yes, they did, definitely. I don't know if it was a single turning point that switched me from being an open-minded skeptic to a believer, but it was certainly one of the key events. If you asked me to take my best shot, I would say that this was the real article. This was extraterrestrial. And that's kind of a, a significant statement coming from a serving member of the Ministry of Defense. And so bearing that in mind, I began to dig deeper into the Flying Triangle reports and also the issue of advanced technology as it relates to what's currently on the secret list and what isn't. And I guess two things primarily focused my attention. One was this low humming noise that um, most of the witnesses who'd seen these things at very low levels said, was that really unpleasant? And they said it almost felt like it was sort of redefining their heart rhythm, you know, giving them palpitations, if you like. And others said it churned their stomach over to the point where they felt sick and nauseous. And I began to file freedom of information requests with various agencies for files on acoustic weaponry and sonic-based weaponry and things like this, and found that as far back as the early to mid-1970s, the Defense Intelligence Agency in particular had done a lot of research um, with a view to creating sound-based weapons that would disrupt internal nervous systems, disrupt organs, disrupt heart rhythms, that sort of thing. And this, the research was actually quite advanced in, in 1972 to 75. So potentially, you know, if there's an argument that some of these technologies are Earth-based, then they have a grounding, they have a, an origin, if you like, when, when we began to looking into these things. The other thing that kind of interested me was the fact that these triangles had the capabilities to fly 20 to 30 miles an hour and up to really extensive speeds. And people have said, well, you know, we, we simply don't have that sort of technology. And I've said, well, you know, it's kind of a gray area. Uh, no pun intended there. <laughs> um, um, one of the things I did was to interview a man who got a lot of publicity in 1997 named Matthew Bevan. And I've interviewed Matthew several times. Um, Matthew is a self-confessed computer hacker, and he's, he's only 29 now. And when he was a teenager, uh, I mean, he's literally a computer genius. He hacked into Wright-Patterson Air Force Base because he, um, he had a personal interest in the Roswell story and was just messing around trying to find files. And what he actually did, he got into a classified area of Wright-Patterson's files and found documentation, email exchanges between personnel and scientists there that were working on what in generic terms you would sort of broadly describe as an anti-gravity type aircraft, a device that could fly and that purely because of the systems involved, you wouldn't have the tremendous G-forces that would be associated with having an aircraft increase its speed from 20 to 30 miles an hour to 2,000 an instant or doing left and right-hand turns, that, you know, that would all be eliminated. And fortunately, this story is one that actually can be validated. If you do an internet search on Matthew Bevan plus computer hacker, you'll find how the Daily Telegraph and the London Observer newspaper did extensive features on him. He was actually arrested by Scotland Yard and, ex and vigorously interviewed. And a lot of these articles are now online. And he was also the subject of two um, Senate, Senate inquiries over here into computer security. And I, I don't endorse people going out and hacking into computers in this today's climate particularly even. But the fact that not only did he uncover this anti-gravity engine, but because of the publicity and his arrest, that the story came out publicly and representatives of American intelligence had to come over to the Old Bailey in London, which is a big court there, to, to look into the case and give testimony, provided evidence that, uh, ironically, the Americans didn't want releasing, that yes, he had acted into sensitive areas dealing with advanced propulsion systems. So as far as I'm concerned, there is a good argument for saying that the technology presence in the flying triangle encounters is representative of an advanced technology. 
there's a good argument for saying that some of the triangles could indeed be man-made aircraft, um, sort of a next generation stealth vehicle that is still on the secret list. Um, I think the problem is though, of course, that's belied by now, the fact that we have these older reports that are now beginning to surface from the 60s and one I actually forgot to mention, I'm sorry? Oh, I thought somebody said something. Um, these reports from the 60s and some early ones from the 1950s, which are now also surfacing, um, identical again in manner, in design, in style, in flight performance. And that to me is the, the key point which suggests these things aren't largely or exclusively man-made, that we're dealing with something that is infinitely far more advanced than anything we're flying today and that we were flying in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. I think I'll be the first one to admit, you know, I, I'm not a believer of the idea that whatever these things are, that it's all going to be good news and they're our friends and they've come to, you know, fix the hole in the ozone layer and cure cancer. I think there's a lot of very sinister things going on with these, particularly the flying triangles, flying around in the dead of night around military bases, you know, abductions with people being taken and given screen memories. I think a lot of it's quite sinister. Um, and I think... When you look at, for example, the, the research community that examines flying triangle reports specifically, and you know, the, the community is kind of polarized between people who think they're secret aircraft and people who believe they're extraterrestrial or interdimensional or whatever, but from somewhere else. You do have this polarized thing where you have one camp versus the other camp. And the big question that is asked, are they uh, human-made, are they alien-made? And I think the question shouldn't be, are they our FTs or are they alien FTs? I think the question that should be asked is, which ones are our FTs and which ones are their FTs? And I think that as our technology advances and possibly with all the rumors about back engineering of, from crash retrievals, I think the line's going to become even more blurred between genuine UFO encounters of a flying triangle nature and possibly ones that we're now developing based on the fact that we're beginning to get to grips with understanding what lies behind this technology. So whether that's going to mean that as far as UFOs are concerned, it's going to allow the governments to hide the subject even more because they can then legitimately say, well, here's a flying triangle we developed and we kept it secret for so long and that's what you were seeing all those years. To an extent, that may be true. But on the other hand, I think it's, it's going to bury even deeper, which is unfortunate, the truth behind the genuine flying triangles. So in conclusion, what I'd just like to say is that if anyone wants to sort of really look at an aspect of the UFO mystery that demonstrates some form of advanced technology, the theme of this week's conference or this weekend's conference, I can't think of anything better than the flying triangles. When you have military personnel talking about seeing these things flying at low level, at speeds going from 20 to 2,000 miles an hour, when you have trained and qualified observers like meteorological officers actually saying these things are flying over military bases at a height of 200 feet and 200 feet from the perimeter fence at 2 o'clock in the morning, you know, that's kind of really eye-opening. And you find the Ministry of Defence just really just doesn't want to deal with these cases. I think here you have a whole collection of weird technology involved and with the sound waves as well, affecting people's nervous systems, you know, potentially you've got a, a lethal weapon if it was put in the wrong hands, which, you know, it may be in the wrong hands. I'm, I'm just speculating. But I hope as far as this aspect of the UFO mystery is concerned, I've given you a few eye-opening and enlightening details. And if anybody's got any questions, either I think I've got to get off stage, but uh, any questions, I'll be glad to answer them outside. Thank you.